Okay, good afternoon. So what I wanted to talk about this afternoon in the 35 minutes or so we've got is um, ERM, the next level. And you go, well, what does that mean? Well, and my role as Chief Research and Content Officer, as we're going to see in a minute, there's kind of three levels of research to me. And there is the kind of pure research. That's what you do after a bottle of wine, generally at night, and uh, shoot the breeze on what is possible, maybe two, three, four, five years ahead. That's fun, a lot of fun. And then there's the kind of applied research is when you've actually got to get a business case, what problem are you trying to solve? That's really annoying when you've got to find a problem to solve because you're having so much fun coming up with these crazy ideas. And then there's the final piece where the rubber hits the road, which is practice kind of right now. Now, as a firm, we do all three levels. I really enjoy the top level, uh, but we've got to get very practical. So I'm going to do a bit of both in this session of thinking a bit further forward, what does next levels mean? But I want to kind of also get very practical with you of something we've certainly been working on as an overarching principle in ERM to kind of move it to the next level. Now, I'm going to talk about one particular aspect, real-time integrated dynamic risk profiling. <clears throat> That's a mouthful. And because we don't have enough acronyms in risk management, because we haven't had some for a while, I thought I'd do a new one, RID. Don't panic, I made this up for the session, we're not going to use it. And uh, it's focusing on what this session is going to be about, which is uh, this. So, first issue is acronyms. I love this quote by Norman, Norman Augustine. He was a very um, prominent CEO in the US, and uh, I love this. Acronyms abbreviations should be used to the maximum extent possible to make trivial ideas profound. I'm hoping this afternoon they're not trivial ideas, so by definition I shouldn't use a lot of acronyms, which I won't. Right, but that said, that's what we're focusing on. Real-time, integrated, dynamic risk profiling. And why am I focusing on this? You'll see in a second we're going to talk a little bit about some of the problems in current risk management. And I want to kind of relay those to personal situations where if we were to use what we currently do in organizations, a lot of organizations in risk management in 2022, and you applied that to your personal life, you'd probably never accept it because it wouldn't be good enough. So I want to get you thinking about what should risk management look like in your personal lives, which then should flow on to what you do in your organizations. So as I was mentioning, yes, we're going to do a little bit of that at the end. We're also going to do a little bit of that, but I'm going to leave you practically with the practical application of what I mean by taking risk management to the next level, so it's not too far. Some of you might already be doing some of it, but it's not too far a leap because I want it to be very tangible and practical of what you can take away. So what I was going to cover is really five elements, and then we'll have a little Q&A at the end. Number one, just a few ideas of maybe some of the problems we've got with current risk management. Now, um, I don't like overly like people who just shoot risk management down all the time. Just join LinkedIn, there's plenty of them on there. And um, it makes me a bit tired if I'm really honest because often fit for purpose, all risk management is good. The fact that people are doing it is great. And if you're immature, and I don't mean that in a negative sense, even doing basics is awesome. It's lifting you to the next level. So I'm very much of a view that risk management like, is an art form. And no artist is right and no artist is wrong. It, the art is fit for purpose, what works for you. So with that said, I'm going to talk about shortcomings, not necessarily what's right and wrong. Number two, I'm going to focus on the life cycle of risk and literally looking at the full life cycle from beginning to end because in order to do more kind of dynamic, real-time integrated reporting, you've really got to understand what risk is and have a look at its life from beginning to end. And once we've done that, managing the life cycle, how do you manage from beginning to end? And from there, moving to continuous dynamic monitoring once we understand the life. And then a few little candid comments in the end about what's kind of next in risk management, maybe moving a bit further up the funnel. So I thought I'd highlight a snapshot of some of the shortcomings that we traditionally see in risk management. And some might resonate, some not. And you might have another 10 on top of this, but it's a starting point. I'm going to go quite quick. Hopefully, they resonate a bit. Risk reporting is often backward looking and infrequent and late. The risk report comes out three weeks after the month end, and if that happens, the person's already thinking about the next month end, not the last month end, and it's like driving your car looking out the rear, rear, rear view mirror. It doesn't work very well. Risk is all about what happens in the future, yet we're all looking backwards. Number two, risk information is often separated. 
the risk processes we have, whether you're doing a risk assessment or risk indicators or incident management, is often reported separately, almost kind of different reports. Also, risk types are often reported separately because we're all special. WHS is special, cyber is special, fraud is special, and often they'll have their own little methodologies and their own reports. We got a new client recently, and the board received eight different risk reports, all written by different people. And no much wonder they were a bit confused. Right? So this siloed approach, which is the biggest problem, right? managing risk in silos rather than the E in enterprise-wide. We'll come to that more later. A weak link between risk management and strategy, which I find kind of a little bit hilarious. Risk is the effect of uncertainty on objectives. A lot of organizations have a risk workshop and go, what are your risks? My response would be, got no idea, because we haven't talked about objectives and strategy, because we've got to get that very strong linkage between the two. That then links with risk reporting. It's often reported separately from reward, where you can't really talk about reward without risk and risk without reward. I often say that in risk management, I'm a marriage guidance counselor, and on one party is risk and the other one's reward. And if you report them separately, it's, going, it's like going to marriage guidance counselling when only one of you is allowed in the room at a time. Um, I'm actually not speaking from experience. <laughs> um, I don't want to get any, but if that was to work, I'm sure it wasn't going to work very well. You want both parties in there talking about the balance between the two. Negative perception, not in this room, because we all love risk, don't we? But the general negative perception of risk and risk managers and how exciting we all are, all completely wrong, by the way. There's then often seen as an add-on to management rather than part of management, that kind of optional extra that's a bit annoying that we have to do, absolutely criminal, but it's there. Insufficient focus, attention and resources, and a lot of that comes from the two above, always the asked item on the to-do list. ERM development is often cumbersome, costly and time-consuming, and sometimes overwhelming to think about doing a project on enterprise risk management. And overcomplicated and confusing, which brings my thought to the wonderful acronyms that we have. And in many ways, I sometimes think as an industry, we're our own worst enemies. Because we've got a confusing and quite complex topic anyway, and then we go and add all these words on that uh, confuse the heck out of people even more. So I'm going to take a position. And that is ERM is queen, ERM is king. We've been talking about ERM for 23 years at Protect. We've never, ever changed. And it's still ERM now, so let's just clear the air. There's a lot of people that argue, is it ERM, GRC, IRM, which one's best? How are they different? I don't know about you, but I'm a bit more of a simpleton and go, it's risk management. And I like the word E in front of it because enterprise wide rather than siloed. So let's think about what it means. Enterprise wide, we are covering all the risks across all the activities, material risk of the organization as commonly and consistently as we can. Risk, it covers all risk types, not looking at them in silos. And the management is not minimization. Management is managing risk with reward. The balance of risk and reward, this is where strategy kicks in. Now, as far as I'm concerned, over 23 years, certainly doing it with a protect, it's always been ERM. And I don't see a reason to change personally, but we might as well add the other ones on. GRC, I don't really get why we call it GRC, because governance is an integral part of ERM anyway. It's completely in the bit above. R is the same. And compliance, well, compliance and compliance, compliance risk management is part of enterprise risk management. It's one of the key risks that we have. So I would suggest that GRC is completely covered by ERM. And then we've got IRM that's raised its uh, head uh, three, four, five years ago. Well, number one, integrated. Integrated is a key feature of enterprise risk management. It's a feature of ERM. It's not somehow different. R's the same and M's the same. So why don't we do ourselves a favor and just come up with one? And if you end up being GRC and you tell me I'm wrong, that's OK. But we just need to start, as an industry, start getting rid of all this variation. We're bad enough confusing ourselves. Leave alone the people at the coalface that we need, want, we need them to be doing risk management. And we come up with all of this. So anyway, that's my bit on acronyms. And uh, ERM is queen. ERM is king for us. Now, thinking about that, these are alter not alternatives. They are part of the same. So what I want to do now is move on to the foundation of doing more dynamic, real-time, integrated risk reporting, and that is to understand exactly what risk is. And to do that, I want to look at the life cycle of risk. And here we go. Number one, the gestation period. Yes, I'm going to talk about animals. 
in that period for risk, emerging risk is starting to happen. It hasn't hit us yet. I think it's out there. Factors are changing. Conditions are developing that might lead to a cause occurring. If we're thinking about weather risk, climate change could be one of those conditional changes, environmental changes. And that could then emanate all the way up to then a cause being a weather-related uh, uh, event, cyclone, whatever. We then move to birth. And birth for us is when the cause occurs, the root cause kicks off. And remember, a root cause is the starting point of risk when we look at it from an organisational perspective, the root cause, root cause analysis and so on. Once we've given birth, we then go through childhood. And childhood for us is what we call the initial events that happen once the cause has happened. And there's often a lot of dominoes lining up here. And these are what we as a firm call interim events or pre-events. And you'll see why in a minute when we put it all together. And then we come to middle age, the main event. And this is often in your life, the thing that defines you as a person. I think there's more than one in most of your lives. Mine is children and mine is also protect, defining events for me, probably around middle age. Then we move to old age. And these are then events that happen after the main event. And again, there are lots of little dominoes lining up. And then we come to twilight years. And twilight years is when it starts impacting on the organization's objectives. Risk is the effect of uncertainty on objectives. And then, and I don't want to be too dark, we move to eulogies, mourning and recovery. And this is where we are now reflecting on the life of that risk, see if we can learn from those mistakes or things that we've done and feed them back into a better life for everybody else. And also, very importantly, recovery back to the best position we can be in. And that, to me, is the life cycle of risk from beginning to end, split into those, um, uh, those, those parts. Why am I doing this? Because if we're going to get more real-time, dynamic, integrated, we need to understand the life cycle to be able to identify the information that gives you information at those different stages of life. So I thought I'd put a little timeline down the bottom with the key points on the timeline, which we're going to refer to in a few minutes. Now we now link that to the building blocks of risk that you might be more familiar with. So let's now have a look at the gestation period. This is all about conditions. Now this is the, what we often look at environmental scans, like what is going on out there. The risk hasn't yet eventuated. Emerging risk kicks in here. We then hit causes, which is for us the beginning of risk as we um, identify it within an organization, root causes. That then moves to events, which moves to impacts on our objectives. And then finally to recovery. Now, if risk was that easy, life would be a little bit easier for us all. But as we know, we don't usually get one cause for risk. We often get multiple causes. And often when an event happens, we get multiple objectives that are impacted. So the reality of it is, is that there's more causes and more events. In addition, we've got to think about the fact that we've got controls. So now that top line was inherent risk. We now need to move to residual risk. How are we controlling this risk? So now let's then take more than one of each of those and it then ends up looking a little bit like this. And for those that know me, you know where I'm leading you to. There's something that we're, certainly um, some of the males tonight might be wearing, the bow tie. Because that is effectively the bow tie. And the bow tie records risks, um, uh, communicates risk from birth to twilight. But remember, out both ends, there's also stuff going on that might be really useful to keep an eye on. Even before a cause occurs, there might be things environmental that you can track that gives you an indication that earlier or things is, uh, something's starting to arise. Again, coming back to what we often call emerging risk. So now, if we take an example of this, right, it might look something like this. We first of all go to conditions, and the conditions might be a lot of uh, climate change, El Nino, whatever it might be that's causing all the rain in Sydney and the East Coast, we'll blame something. And all the factors that might create a lot of moisture. That also might create a lot of uh, growth, things like moss on rocks. You'll see where I'm going with this in a second. And this then might affect our child who's playing in the local park, climbing a rock to have a bit of fun. 
And we're now going to do a little bow tie on falling from heights of your little child as they try and climb the rock. That's the context. Now conditions, as I said, moisture, more rain, and what that, that lead to. Okay, we're now at our first cause, which is rain, while the child is playing in the park. We also get moss hazard on rock to make the rock slippery. We get the child themselves, they were born, and children, as you're going to see, are prone to error. We get manufacturer defect because uh, um, supply chain issues, therefore they've got to accept dodgy materials. We're certainly seeing that in the building industry. Have a look at the quality of wood if you're trying to uh, do any kind of building. It's desperately bad at the moment, even if you're lucky to get any. So that would be a condition, supply chain issues leading to manufacturer defect. And also an adequate process given to the child from mum and dad, because mum and dad are really busy and stressed because they didn't uh, attend Wayne's session this morning. And as a result, the, uh, they've given the child some really bad stuff to try and climb the rock. Now, once we've done that, we move now to the next phase, which is childhood. So now the interim events start happening. Water on the floor, the child could slip. Slippery rock with moss could lead to the same thing. Human error because the child is young. Weak materials leading to equipment failure, and that could also come from inadequate process. Now, that is the childhood. Right? That's the childhood. Then we come to the main event, middle age. And that all leads to what you typically call the risk in your risk register. Some people call it the main event. That's what Protec does. Others call it the top event. I don't care what you call it. And this is typically the short name of the risk in your risk register. And I'd expect to see falling from heights in the child's risk register or the parent's risk register. Now, we got to middle age. Now, we need to go into the older age period. And this is now we start saying, well, once that main event has happened, what happens next? Firstly, they fail to reach the top of the rock that they were climbing. They fail to play on the rock for any length of time. They fail to wear the appropriate PPE, and they fail to reach ground level safely. This is now old age. Now we come to the twilight years, which is impact on objectives. And now the child has failed to have fun, because that was one of their objectives. They've also then uh, failed to comply with the park rules, because they weren't wearing their PPE. And they've also uh, got injured and one of their objectives was well-being, especially after this morning's session, uh, and the end. We then move to an incident occurring, cart the child off to hospital, get them a new set of shoes, and we go to recovery, learning from past mistakes and so on. And that is an example of beginning to end life cycle of risk. The middle bit is the bow tie, and at the end, you've got the factors that influence causes, and you've got then the recovery from the incident that has occurred. Now, once we do that, we then add on controls, and I've given her a few controls, hazard, ins hazard inspections and cleanup, non-slip shoes, risk training, cushions, safety hats, and uh, first aid. The end. Now, when you're doing that eulogy, that would be the picture you'd have up the front there. This is the life of risk. Now, the interesting thing is that we can look at that life in two ways. Once when an incident actually happens, and we do a lot of that in terms of root cause analysis and so on, but this is more importantly understanding risks that haven't yet happened. So this should really support our risk uh, registers, whatever you want to call it, and this supports the understanding of that risk in a bit more detail. Now, in terms of that then, there's one last thing, which is uh, what's the uh, length of life of that particular risk? We typically call that risk velocity, which is the speed at which a risk travels through its life, and it basically is that. That was fairly fast, that one. But I could have done a really slow one. So what that means is now different risks have different um, periods in that life, and they have different speeds each stage. So gestation periods. Now, it gives me a great opportunity now to talk about that for each one of our key risks, we really should have some kind of visualization. We love the bow tie sitting behind it so everybody understands the life cycle of risk. Now, as a firm, we believe that should be at board level. If you've got 15 board risks, you should have 15 bow ties. But we are very biased because I love a bow tie. You're going to see mine tonight. And supporting that, as you then cascade the risk down into the business, use the bow ties based on fit for purpose use. Now, some of you will know this as what we call risk taxonomies, risk taxonomies, risk classifications. And I've always wondered why we call it risk taxonomies, because taxonomy is about the science of naming, describing, and classifying organism, including plants and animals. 
So are we saying risk is an animal, a beast? Now, as a result of that, I thought we might as well carry on this then and think about the different types of risk that you might face. And a lot has to do with the velocity of the risk. And I thought I'd pick up the extremes. And I would have done a trivial pursuit question, but we don't have buzzers. But someone might call it out. Which animal has got the longest gestation period? Good, the African elephant. It's absolutely right. So that's the first one. Sorry, the second one. And that might come across. I've ruined my earlier one, haven't I? The rabbit. <laughs> And on the right-hand side, we've got elephant risks. And elephant risks are slow-moving, slow-velocity risks, but they're usually big, big climate change. And the risk we have with these is they go so slow, we go, oh, we'll do it tomorrow. Oh, we've got time. We'll go for a good lunch, go for dinner. We'll do it another day. We keep deferring, deferring, till you get so far through its life, it's not recoverable anymore. Sound familiar? And then I've ruined the other one, haven't I? But the rabbit has got the shortest gestation period, 31 days or thereabouts, but a lot smaller. And these are the risks where very high uh, uh, frequency happening all the time, BAU type risks, but their impact's not that big. Now, why am I telling you this? Because obviously the speed at which they run at really influences the way you manage those risks. So if you've got a very fast velocity risk, you need to be monitoring it almost real time. If you've got a very slow one, you don't have to check it every 10 minutes, maybe once a, uh, six months, once a year. A good example of this is uh, an, an aircraft. The cockpit of an aircraft is a risk system, lots of risk indicators. How quickly do they record and report those? Every thousandth of a second, because the velocity of risk in an aircraft is about the fastest you're ever going to experience. From a problem occurring to being on the ground could be a matter of seconds. 30 seconds, so it's very, very um, uh, dynamic, real-time risk management. So we've got to remember fit for purpose. You wouldn't want to put a lot of effort into dynamic, real-time reporting of risk when it's incredibly slow, but the risk you run at very slow is deferring, procrastinating for another day. So you've got to make sure you don't miss those. Now, while we're at it and talking about animals, and I didn't quite know how to fit this into my presentation, but I should pay due respect to the black swan and the gray rhino. I'm not going to talk any more than that, but uh, suffice to say that uh, I think the, um, the swan is about 45 days, but you can't say gestation, you have to say incubation. And uh, the grey rhino is about 450 days, just for your trivial pursuit knowledge, so they're somewhere kind of in the middle. Now, what does this all do for us? Once we've tracked the life cycle of risk, we now have what we refer to as the risk skeleton, the risk skeleton. And what that risk skeleton is, is a skeleton of all of the key risks that you guys face. And it's the skeleton that tells you the parts. But that skeleton hasn't got any clothes on at the moment, or it doesn't have any meat on the bones. So it's the starting point for enterprise risk management is knowing what your skeleton is. And then it's a case of now collecting information that you can now talk to this, and you can use this to get a really good picture of what is happening with your risks or your key risks across the organization. So that's what I want to look at now, is managing the life cycle of risk. Once we understand the skeleton, what does managing its life cycle look like? Okay, here we go. So it's now adding information to the skeleton. Now, I'm not here to advocate which method is better than others. Some have kind of got past their due by date. I'm just showing out practices that we typically see in risk management, good, bad, or ugly, in 2022 and beyond. A lot of change is going to happen in this, but it is what it is. Number one. The wonderful risk assessment on the wonderful 5x5 matrix with a dot somewhere in the middle. I'm not going to get into a debate the value of that, but we typically do it. What does that give us? It gives us an inherent risk rating and a residual risk rating based on the likelihood and impact of the main event. That's a starting point. Number two might be key risk indicators. And we start then tracking information that talks to different parts of the life. The nodes of the bow tie, as we call it. And as we know, as a risk develops through its life, it usually gives off symptoms, red flag puffs of smoke. You just got to be able to identify what they are, pick them up, and then turn them into intelligence by applying some tolerance levels around it. And as an example, I've just popped those on to the various spots. That's key risk indicators. Next, we've got controls assurance. With controls assurance, depending on methodology you might use, you might scale the controls as being effective, E, partially effective, P, an ineffective eye, and I've just added a few of those onto a few of the controls there to tell us what's going on. 
The next one might be incidents. And we look back historically at actual incidents of this particular risk, and we do a count. We also might measure the scale of the incident, but we do a count. As you can see there, I've got nine incidents over the previous, I don't know, I'll make it up six months. And every time that's happened, of those, seven of them were caused by cause number one, five, three, two. And you might go, that doesn't add up to nine. Well, often an incident has more than one cause that comes together. So it's not going to equal the actual number of incidents because we've got a multiple uh, um, uh, causes happening. Down the right-hand side, I'm now measuring the number of times an incident created an impact of type on the side, whether it be financial impact, reputation, customer dissatisfaction, whatever. And we're now starting to get a bit of an historical view of this particular risk. Now, that's just a number count. There's no reason why you can't add on magnitude. What is the size of the financial loss? What's the size of the reputation? And that is what we're going to learn from actual incidents. The final one in a typical uh, core elements of, of enterprise risk is then issues and actions management. Where have we got issues? Where have we got actions that are outstanding? Now, the way I've done this, I've done AMBER, four outstanding actions on that control, three of which are overdue. Right, over on the left, we control, we've got two outstanding actions, none of them are overdue. And we also now have where that control is linked, where the weakness is. We're going to cover that bit more later because it does actually matter whereabouts you're looking in the life cycle of risk. As we know, that is the beginning of the life cycle over there, so more prevention. Over here, the end of the life cycle, more cure. And you've got to work out whether prevention is better than cure. But we have a, a, a saying on that one, which we'll come to a little bit later. And that then gives us the meat on the bones. Now, I just took five main components of ERM. There are others, a bit more specialist project risk management and risk in change and so on and so forth that you could add to it, but I didn't want to make it too messy. And once we've got that, you can then pull that together to go, OK, how does ERM link to the life cycle of risk roughly? And it goes something like this. Risk assessment, good, bad or ugly, is really about the beginning of the risk. Because generally in those workshops that you might hold, you're talking about risk exposures that you have. And these risks might not be happening right now, but we're just aware that our business is exposed to that risk. And then, if you wish, in a risk register and do the lovely stuff that you generally do. So it's generally talking more about the beginning of the risk way before it maybe even ever happens. We then move on to key risk indicators. And key risk indicators can attach to any part of the life cycle of risk. But you'll appreciate if they attach to the left-hand side, they are leading indicators, leading indicators. If they attach to the right-hand side, they're lagging indicators. And as we know, most risk management frameworks are full of laggers, because they're the easy ones, because we're collecting them anyway. The leading ones are a lot tougher to get hold of, but when you can get hold of them, they're absolutely fantastic, but a bit more work's required to do that. Once we've got that, we can then move on to our controls. And again, controls can be anywhere in the bow tie, anywhere in the life. Typically up at the left, we've got preventative controls, somewhere in the middle, detective controls, and down the right-hand side, reactive or corrective controls. So we're starting to get our risk management framework starting to be mapped to the life cycle of risk. We then move on to incident management. Incident management, by definition, is you've gone through the main event and you're feeling pain. So that's more down the right-hand side, right, when the risk has actually occurred. And then in terms of issues and actions management, that's more around the eulogy and looking at the life and going, what can we learn from those mistakes? And that's down the right-hand side. Now, obviously, I had a bit of fun putting all this together because it's not easy. It's a lot of linkages. But what you've got to try and do is make sense out of this so it is useful in terms of our risk reporting for number one, assurance, and number two, decision making. And that's what we're trying to ultimately get to. And a lot of the risk reporting we see at the moment isn't good for either because it is historical, it's very infrequent, it's not integrated, therefore it's not very good for those two key purposes. So with that said then, I want us to think about moving to a continuous dynamic monitoring approach to risk profiling rather than that periodic once every whatever view. Now the reason I, we as a firm really focusing on it, I guess going back 23 years when um, I co-founded ProTech with my partner, another David, and um, 
over my life before that, I used to take quite a lot of risks personally. Some of you will know this um, stuff, but I'm very much more conservative. I used to do a lot of motorcycle racing, hang gliding, skydiving, or whatever. Think motorcycle racing. If you think about that, the immediacy of risk, what do you think I relied on? Do you think I would go out to Eastern Creek, because I'm Sydney-based, and I go, well, my bike had a service six months ago. Happy days. No, not doing that, because six months ago, anything could have happened in the previous six months. Would I say, oh, I haven't had any incidents the last two years, so I'm good? A bit stupid to be thinking that, because we don't know around what's the next, around the next bend. What I relied mostly on was that little dash, which has got the warning lights, the rev clocks, the temperature gauge, the oil pressure and everything else. And I would look at that probably on average about every six or seven seconds, especially down the main straight at Eastern Creek at about 230 k's an hour. You want to be very confident that what you're sitting on has got its risk managed properly. Some of you would have heard me in other training go, you know, why does <coughs> have certain controls in place, and I use the example of the Formula One car, why does it have very expensive brakes, because that's a control. Why does a motorbike have very expensive brakes? And you're gonna go to stop you, to save you, to keep you safe, no it's not, it's to allow the bike to go faster. That's the purpose of good controls, is to allow your organization to go faster. So what that means now is that if we're gonna do that and truly allow risk management to support our organization's going faster and safer. We have to move it to the risk manager you'd expect riding a bike like that or racing a car like that, which is dynamic, integrated risk reporting. And that is to be one of the big weaknesses we currently have. So let's have a look at what that might look like. So in the middle, we've now got the wonderful skeleton that we just talked about, and then we can furnish it with all the bits and pieces that we've got in place typically. And here we've got the five elements that we've spoken about before, right, the key core components of enterprise risk management. Now, if we were to furnish it in the way that I spoke about, it can get a little bit messy. That is putting your green and ambers and reds all over the bow tie. That said, I'm a huge fan of that. Just for us at the moment, we don't have that currently, but my God, am I really keen to get it where we can start furnishing the skeleton with all the green, amber and reds and give the full life cycle view of that risk at any time. In the interim, we're trying to do it in a way that's a little bit easier to understand. And so what we do is consolidate all of that information linked to the same central core risk in your risk taxonomy, which is why in ERM, having a really, really strong central enterprise risk taxonomy of your key risks is critical because it allows integration, where everything you do is then linked to those central risk categories. Now, I showed a slide earlier with the um, high level uh, uh, risk categories on, risk event categories. We would typically see about 15 at board level, would be typical. Any more than 15 board members glaze over, and so they should, any less than about nine or 10. We think you're probably missing a couple, and so we'd expect probably 10 to 15. Now the idea then is as we do our enterprise risk management, we then always link the information to the same central risk taxonomy item. There's the integration, the I in ERM. Think about that, the I in ERM. The integration part of ERM that's what we're doing, linking data together to be able to then show the data as an integrated whole. Now that for us, blowing it up so you can see it a little bit better, really gives us then a view of the risk together with then risk assessment, risk indicators, compliance, control testing, actions, internal audit findings, incidents. And as you create more processes and data in risk management, you then link more. So it's almost like the artist's palette. If you're more, not quite as mature, you might only have three colors. You might do risk assessment, incidents, a little bit of compliance. Well, that's fine, link that. And as you then develop the next palette and you do risk indicators, link those in, and slowly over time, you build up that profile, that more comprehensive integrated profile. And what the idea then is rather than relying on any one piece of information, we can now triangulate, or whatever eight of them are, octagate, I'm not sure that's a word, anyway, the information, does it make sense? So I know you're sick of COVID, but sorry, the second one on the list is COVID risk. I might as well finish it off, given that we're actually finally here. 
and that is showing us a moderate inherent risk assessment for COVID and a moderate residual risk assessment. Now, if you rely purely on a risk assessment, a lot of us sit there and go, yeah, but that was wet fingers in the air, lots of judgment, all the problems we have with risk assessments. And people shoot down risk assessments and the five by five matrix, and that's probably reasonably valid, except to say it's one source of information. But rather than relying just on one source, why don't you triangulate with other information? What else have we got? We've got one control test that's been done and it passed, didn't fail. So that doesn't really add to that, but that's okay. Compliance, six compliance questions, which might be many and varied, and one has failed. We've answered no, we did not comply. We've got three key risk indicators, and one is in red, it's outside of tolerance. That's starting to make a bit more sense now, is why we don't have a big gap between inherent and residual. Well, it, doesn't, it, it makes a little bit of sense. We move across to the, we've had one incident over that period of time. So it's starting to kind of support the overarching view of what's happening with this risk. If we were to go to another one and we go down to say unauthorized access to sensitive data, high inherent risk assessment, the finger in the air, low residual risk assessment. That implies we've got great controls and they're working brilliantly between the two. Let's have a look. We've got uh, 14 compliance questions, two answered negatively. No, nope, didn't comply. We've got uh, 12 risk indicators, two are in red. Well, I think I'd be going back and questioning that assessment now and going, I'm not sure I agree with you. Right? That's not kind of coming together. It doesn't make sense as a group as a whole. So what you're actually doing now is starting to get multiple sources of information and kind of cross-referring them so that the profile in its entirety does it make sense. Now that to us is a lot more powerful than relying on only one source. So people will say to us, oh, the five by five matches is a load of rubbish. I can sometimes agree with that. But I always say fit for purpose. People all use it. Most do. It's at board level. They're used to it. So let's not throw the baby out with the bathwater, but let's be realistic about what it can and cannot tell you. But use it, but maybe don't rely on it for 100%. Maybe start adding other bits of data to give a bigger picture. Now, again, if I think about driving a motorbike or a car, you've got to think about then you don't use one source of information. You use the, uh, what the mechanic said when they tested it. You will check the tire pressures and tires wear, which would be your, uh, uh, um, your key risk indicators. You look at the dash, you do a bit of maintenance beforehand and you do all of that. That's what gives you confidence, not just one source of information. We drill down a bit into COVID because now you've got the board level kind of assessment integrated view. And then we drill down behind it. But the first thing behind it is a bow tie, right? Because that is the skeleton on which you just built your profile. And then behind that profile, if you want to go, why is that red? Right? What's the reason behind it? You want to be able to drill down with data. We call it linked items report, which drills down behind it, gives you a time series of the information. And this now allows investigation. Right? Why did that go into red? Why was that, you know, why, why, why did the control fail? And this allows. So if we go up to here, we can see that the uh, controls, it failed, remember? And we had uh, design effectiveness, and this is uh, PPE, face mask, protective uh, clothing and gloves. And uh, design effectiveness, spot on. Beautiful masks, they were just wonderful. Uh, operating effectiveness failed miserably because no one was wearing them. <clears throat> Thank you. Okay. So no one was wearing them, that's why it failed. So now we can have a conversation, why did that control fail? And we can now see behind it why. So we talk about one source of truth with multiple uses of that information. So I just want to finish off with then with what's next in risk management. Just a few thoughts. The first one is trying to think about creating a jigsaw puzzle of all the information you have available about that skeleton, that risk. So we're certainly as a firm and you know, generally the market is moving to BYO, which doesn't mean bring your own wine. It means build your own enterprise risk management. And I guess the best analogy is the app store platform and you drag that in, drag this in and oh I like the look of that one and so on. And so for us we call that marketplace, one of our more recent um, things we've worked on, very close to launch. And that really is click and drag, bringing in the elements that you wish to bring in and uh, choosing the level of maturity, whether you be level one, level two, level three maturity. And that then enables that 
when it comes in, it's then integrated because it's all linked to those central libraries. And this allows the artist to build the ERM framework that is fit for purpose for them. And we think that's quite a, a, a big step forward in ERM, moving away from you've got to do it the way that the you know, person said to being able to design and build your own. Because one of the things we always find is fit for purpose. And what is going to work for one organization might be a little bit different from another. So we think that's going to be certainly a big, big change in the future. And finally, here's a few thoughts. I think we're going to see a big increase in speed and deployment of ERM. Going away from the months and months of heartache and pain trying to get a system in, that is going to be a big change. Focus on RID and RIM. I told you I'd throw an acronym. So real-time, integrated dynamic risk assessment or risk reporting, sorry. And for us, RIM is risk in motion on the sense of it being dynamic. A focus on risk, get rid of the word risk, focus on management. Risk management, when done well, is just good management. All right? So I would like to think one of my objectives is to do myself out of a job when risk management is simply part of management. It's not there yet, but it's starting to change. Blurring of the edges between risk management and management. We've got a lot of clients that once they get their ERM capability, they build all sorts of management tools within it because they're starting to see a blurring of the lines. Increased use of data analytics. AI, ML, all the other buzzwords we like to use, I just like to call it just data, the use of data. And I've shown you a bit today how we're starting to see the power of that uh, integrated data. A focus on outcome management rather than risk management. So a much stronger linkage between risk management and objectives and strategy. Increased focus on opportunity risk management. We still talk mostly about threats, how it can hurt us. But what about where you take a risk and the outcome's better? than what you expect. I always say to people, I love risk and I love risk management. And the reason I love risk is because what it can give me way better than what I could expect, the taking of intelligent risk. Increased engagement of the masses. Everyone's a risk manager. Therefore, we need to get rid of our acronyms, our big words, and we've got to talk plain, everyday, realistic language because every single employee is a risk manager. We're certainly seeing it with a lot more users of our system being the non-risk people in the business. What does this all lead to? We go back to the shortcomings and put a line through every one of them, which is the whole purpose of this in the first place. I'll let you process that, but I've tried to cover as many of those shortcomings as you can. And the great thing about that is once you do that, it then increases value delivery of risk managers being loved. And don't we all want to be loved? I've been an auditor, been a chartered accountant, I've been an internal auditor, I've been a risk manager, sucker for punishment, um, but I still love to be loved. And over the last probably six, seven years, uh, we've seen a lot more love. And uh, just recently, honestly, in the last two years, the amount of love that risk managers get is phenomenal. I hope you're feeling it. But we've got to make sure we do everything right to be loved. And I think a lot of the issue of getting to the next step in risk management is making our data much more relevant for management decision making and assurance, and also making it much more real time. So when I ride my motorbike, I'm looking that way. I'm not looking that way, because that's going to end in tears, which is a lot of what risk management is at the moment. It's backward looking.